Warning, the radio broadcast you're about to hear was made by men and for men. It may at times seem a little rough around the edges, brash, and certainly not canonically approved by papal authority. But its content may indeed challenge you to become the man, father, or husband God has called you to be. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another week of The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy. So glad you are here. Hope you guys are enjoying your summer. I know I've been enjoying mine, taking some time off, relaxing a little bit. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, how we need to sometimes, you know, take a break, relax, pull back from uh, such seriousness all the time. I think, uh, you know, if, we, if we're too focused, too laser focused on, on the matters at hand in our world, I think we would probably go crazy. Um, and that being said, that's why I'm going to bring on one of my good friends because we're going to we're going to talk about that and we're going to figure out how we can uh, you know stay focused but also not get lost in all of the craziness and um, things going on in our world, our church, in society. And to join me again, I've got my good friend Frank Kona. Frank is a follower of the traditional Latin Mass. He is a Marine sniper. And the son of one of our children's godparents. Frank Kona, thanks for coming back on The Obligation. I'm glad you're here. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. It's always a fun time here. Uh, absolutely. So, yeah, trying to get my my head uh, a little focused. Maybe I've been on vacation a little too much. So my head's uh, in a bunch of different places right now. Maybe, maybe floating out there on the ocean, hoping I can catch some fish sometime this summer. It's been a tough you got to uh, drink more coffee or get into uh, smoking cigarettes or something like that. Something to help your brain stay switched on. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Always engaged, just uh, sometimes floating off in a different stratosphere here and there with everything going on. But um, but yeah, thanks again for coming on. You know, it's always great to have you on, have your perspective. And, uh, you know, I guess the last time we talked we were uh, in conversation regarding the Carolina Catholic Media uh, Pledge Drive, share that was on the Feast of the Sacred Heart and uh, had some wonderful news from the Supreme Court justices, found out that Roe versus Wade uh, had been reversed. You know, how about that? Thanks be to God. Thank God for that. What a great victory that was. That's right. Uh, yeah, you know, back, handing it back to the states, handing it back to the people. You know, um, certainly not a full outlawing of abortion, but definitely a step in the right direction. Um, yeah, anywhere there's a blue county, I mean, they're just going to do what they're going to do. But now red counties have the right to do what they want to do, like make murder illegal. That's nice. <laughs> That's a big yeah. step forward, I think. Yeah, I even heard our, our own governor, you know, basically giving testimony that North Carolina will be a sanctuary state for abortion you know, amongst uh, yes. several other blue states. It's something to be proud of, right? <laughs> oh, man. I heard something about a, uh, a floating abortion clinic in the Gulf of Mexico that might be an option as well. Oh, well, let's hope it sinks. Let's hope it's a sinking abortion clinic sometime soon. Maybe God can strike it with a lightning bolt. Yeah, yeah, you know, that... We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see what the people have to say about it. I mean, the majority of folks, I believe, are, are against uh, most cases of abortion. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, with the way the country's going right now, uh, hopefully we will we'll see a nice uh, change at our mid -term. pledge drive. You know, we're talking about Catholicizing, you know, media, you know, using that which may, you know, for all intents and purposes, may, you know, may just be something we think, you know, I got to throw my hands up. I got to walk away from it. It's so corrupt, you know, especially social media. Well, our news, we know that. Uh, it's hard to get good news, good, honest news anywhere. Um, but instead of throwing our hands up, throwing the towel in, but, you know, taking it and Catholicizing it, you know, using these, these methods, these platforms to spread the truth of the gospel, to spread the Catholic faith, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's taking on, you know, instead of just, you know, writing it off, I think uh, if we use it, properly, we can really uh, do some holy damage uh, into into the messages that are being presented to us, don't you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, why bother waiting? If you were sitting around waiting for 
permission from your parish or a grant from the diocese or something, why bother? Just start doing something. Start writing, start recording, just start doing it. And right. uh, the benefit to that is that we have access to the internet, which is a great tool for uh, spreading information around. I mean, you can just write a little bit. Even people on Facebook, all, some of my Facebook friends write these really great pious Facebook posts. And, uh, you know, it's edifying. So. Yeah, you know, as I've as I've continued to do this show, uh, you know, we've set up a Instagram account and we've set up a Facebook account. I, I think mostly, you know, we we're probably probably most engaged on Instagram. That seems to be more of a kind of a trending spot there. Uh, Facebook, I typically, for myself personally, I'll use more as a uh, as a picture book, scrapbook kind of thing, a place where I can dump <laughs> all my photos off my camera of the family. At least have a spot where I'm gonna you know have access to them and maybe. You know, once a year, I'll get a reminder, you know, of a memory and which is kind of nice, you know, because we know in, the, in the, the digital realm, you know, the amount of photos we take and the, the amount of memory and storage used for those photos then we, that we may not ever even see again. Uh, for me, mm-hmm. that's that's what I kind of use for Facebook. But Instagram, I think it's it's more of a. I even, you know, can use it for news, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's a lot of you know good new um, pertinent. Um, news articles have come across. Um, it's it's good that you recognize that because um, I don't want to sound like this is an ageist statement or anything, but the consensus is that Facebook is boomer. Instagram is kind of for everybody else, Gen X and below. And there's something yeah. about the way those apps are coded and the way that they force you to interact. It's just yeah. older people tend to like Facebook more and then younger people tend to like Instagram more. So I think that's true. I guess the... Yeah, like the content you see on Instagram sometimes is there's a little more brevity there and it, it seems a little more focused in a lot of ways. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. There's a, a wide array, a wide, a, a wide array of content and um, and folks putting that content together. I mean, I, I see, you know, nuns doing uh, some some quick uh you know, memes or videos and, uh, you know, priests jumping on there. And uh, of course, you know, a lot of good news agencies uh, will be on there and then you kind of get, you know, up to date pretty quickly on, on what's going on. Uh, we certainly have to be careful. You know, it, it is addictive. I mean, it's made that way, you know, it's made that way just <laughs> yeah. like television was made that way to sell advertising and social media, even more so um, yeah. the, you know, with the pop-up ads and things like that. have got to be careful by the amount of time. It's- yeah, it's especially dangerous to men because uh, the way that men communicate is basically, I guess, really subtle forms of one-upmanship a lot of the time. And yeah. learning the news and being plugged into the news is a really accessible form of one-upmanship that you know some sometimes subconsciously men fall into. So back yeah. in the day, it was like newspapers and news and obsessing over current events, and now there's like just a, such a much bigger outlet for that on social media for just staying plugged in the news and it can become obsessive and weird. It's like, you don't need to know all the news. I mean, you don't have to know everything that's going on in Rome. It's, I mean, if you examine yourself sometimes, like I do that with myself, am I learning the news as a self-serving instrument? Am I learning it to puff up my pride and to flex on people with how much I know, or is it something I actually need to know? Am I doing this because I want to, because I need the knowledge? Because I want to make yeah. a difference with using the knowledge. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, since I've started doing the show and, and engaging in social media, doing research for the shows, I certainly am educating myself more on matters of the church. Um, you know, things going on in the world, uh, pertinent. You know, news articles that relate. You know, to the church. You know, of course, as abortion or marriage, um, things of that nature. Uh, of course, the liturgy and what's going on and, you know, the, some of the contentious, you know, positions, you know, uh, for and against the traditional Latin mass, which, you know, is, is pretty much one of the hot, hot items right now. I think um, that you'd say, you know, within the church, you know, it's, it's even one of those, you know, from, from Rome down, you know, we're just, we're seeing that's, that's a hot button item. Um, you know, we know abortion obviously is the, is the number one, you know, topic when it comes to news and, and, and the evil, you know, precipitating down from it. But, uh, but the liturgy itself, you know, that's, that's affecting a lot of folks. And that's what we've been talking about, you know, for a lot of months, you know, we haven't yeah. really gotten into it, you know, recently, but, um, but there's a, you know, there's a, there's a growing 
sense of two types of camps, you know, your, your Novus Ordo camp and your traditional Latin mass camp. And, uh, and that's unfortunate, you know, it, it probably, it probably was already there, but now that, you know, with Pope Francis and Traditiones Custodes last July, you know, implementing further, um, ramifications and uh, further guidelines and, and rulings uh, against the promoting of the traditional Latin mass. I think we've, we've seen the camps really dig in because the traditional Catholics, you know, they're not, they're not going anywhere. You know, they're not going to just pack it into the local Novus Ordo parish. Um, it's getting bigger too. You know, I mean, the some traditional of, camp is no longer just a fringe thing. Like it was in the seventies and eighties. You know, like talking to Mr. De Piante about how things were back then. It's it's crazy how much bigger it is because anytime you talk to somebody that's outside of the church, they're vaguely aware, at least they're like, oh, do you do like the uh, traditional Catholicism, all Latin thing, or do you do like regular? So it, again, no, that's not a really good definition of both camps, but at least yeah. there's awareness of the difference because both of them are getting more defined. Right. Yeah, you know, so speaking of, you know, social media and Catholicizing social media, I mean, there's just, there's a, there's a thousand, you know, uh, you know pages out there, uh, Catholic memes, uh, you know, different, different. The memes. Uh, the memes. <laughs> yeah. The memes are good. We have some good Catholic memers out there. They're doing, uh, yeah, absolutely. doing very fine work. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just kind of dabbling. I'm just kind of getting into it. And, uh, just starting to, you know, put a few out there. And I guess, you know, speaking of the, the social media component, you know, I put something out there, you know, this, this past Sunday, we, we had the Good Samaritan Sunday, you know, in the Novus Ordo, right? That was the gospel. And I, it just hit me in the morning. I read the gospel and I was thinking about, I was thinking about the traditional Latin mass. I was thinking about how Rome is entertaining and uh, being very friendly you know, and welcoming to, to to anything and everything but the traditional Latin Mass. You know, and the Synod itself, you know, it's you know, even shows you know to what degree that is. You know, they're you know, entertaining you know groups that are proponents of female priests and married priests and ministering. Uh, not in this minister. I don't. Want, and I want to clarify because we had Father Colin Blatchford on from Courage International, who, who is an amazing priest. And I have great respect for, for Father Blatchford and the Courage um, ministry and apostolate. You know, they minister to same-sex attracted uh, Catholics who are striving to live as Christ has called them to live, you know, including um, celibacy, you know, modesty. Um, they're not trying to convert um, the, the, those with same sex attractions, you know, that they're ministering to them, helping to show them how they should live that way. Uh, or, you know, the way that Christ is calling them, you know, how, the, you know, how they can, you know, take whatever burden or whatever, um, you know, uh, attractions maybe they have just like any of us, just like you have, just like I have, I have, you know, there are temptations on a daily basis, especially if we're down at the beach. I'm sorry. I can, I can walk out there, you know, and, you know, and without even trying uh, if I look up just to make sure I don't fall in a hole, you know, there's probably going to be a temptation out there. So, so it's, it's, um, their courage is not trying to convert them from, from their, who they are. Right. Um, but they also aren't going to condone what they're doing, you know, and, and they're not going to, uh, you know, just, just go along with and say, well, okay, well you have those attractions. So we're just going to support you and we're going to go to your weddings and we're going to, you know, say it's okay when it's not okay. We know it's not okay. Um, so, you know, that being said, that's kind of, you know, Rome is doing that. Romans, Rome is kind of going along with every sort of ideology uh, and every kind of opinion, except for the traditional at mass. For whatever reason, you know, we can, we can entertain all these modern novelties and these, um, you know, modern, these secular ideals. But if it has to do with tradition, and and what the church has done for 1500 years you know that's just off off limits so so anyway back to this post so so this post hit you know I'm, i read the gospel and you know of course we know that the uh, the man fell in with robbers and was left there on the side of the road and everybody walked by and ignored him um but the samaritan came 
and he took care of him. He took him to an inn. He paid for his, his, uh, his night and he paid for food. And he told the innkeeper, you know, on my way back, I will, um, I'll pay for whatever else, you know, may spend. So obviously, you know, this is the good Samaritan. This is the good Samaritan story. And this is what, you know, our Lord told the young man who was questioning, well, who is my neighbor? Uh, go and do likewise, right? So he gave him this this example of, of who it was. So I had this in my head and I'm thinking of Pope Francis and, you know, talking about, you know, who's our neighbor? And, you know, you know I thought of, thought of Mr. Rogers, you know, had an image <laughs> of Mr. Rogers, you know, saying, howdy neighbor, and won't you be my neighbor? So anyway, I depicted this image of the Samaritan, the Good Samaritan story, uh, the robbers kind of a- attacking the, the man. And, uh, and I, you know, I had Francis there as, as one of the, the guys standing over while it's going on. And I had listed the TLM, the traditional Latin mass, as the young man who had kind of fallen under these, uh, these robbers. And, uh, so I put a little there and then I had Pope Benedict who was actually, he's, he was the image of the good Samaritan. Cause I, I visualized Pope Benedict kind of reaching out to, um, you know, to this young man to help him to lift him up. So like, like Pope Benedict did, he lifted down to the downtrodden to these traditional Catholics back in, uh, Gosh, Samora Pontificum, is that right? In 2007, when he allowed the traditional Latin mass to kind of be more freely uh, spread and used. So I had this imagery in my head, all right? So, and I just, I put it out there. So that was it. So it was, it was uh, Benedict as the Samaritan and Pope Francis kind of as the robber kind of coming and taking away uh, from the young man and, and the poor traditional Latin mass uh folks, you know, being kicked and left on the side of the road. And a meme and, was born. Uh, You're a memer now, Jason. <laughs> I know, right? I'm uh, I'm not a boomer. I think I'm, I'm, I'm following the Gen <laughs> X, but I'm learning. So I thought, all right, I'm going to go ahead and throw it out there. And um, and I think it was, for the most part, most people got it. Most people appreciated it. I got, you know, some some good commentary there. And, and that's really what it's about, right? It's about engaging conversation. It's about getting people to think and uh, I wasn't necessarily, you know, saying that Pope Francis is evil and Pope Francis is attacking anyone. Um, I was using a little bit of imagery there, a little artistic uh, interpretation. And uh, and don't, you know, I, t- I had some guys, you know, like, oh, that's just completely wrong. It's disrespectful. How could you talk about the Holy Father that way? Uh, that's just, oh, you know, that's you? just sinful. <laughs> and, and I guess the image I used, I mean, it was a little cutting edge, you know, I found an image of, of Mr. Rogers kind of smiling in the background. And, and from what I've heard, it's a fake picture. You know, have you heard about this, you know, about this Mr. Rogers? Yeah, but, it, but it's Mr. Rogers flipping the bird or something. Right? Yeah, right. It's super <laughs> ironic. Like, it's just, it's just. It's really funny. I thought it was it's funny. It's kind of funny. It's yeah. just, it just, they don't go together, right? Like, it's not something that you typically <laughs> see. It's just, he's smiling, being Mr. Rogers that we know, given the mm-hmm. bird, just, you know, and, and so. Um, and that was kind of who I had, you know, as the head of, of, of Francis kind of just, you know, given the bird to the traditional Latin mass and to Benedict, because in my opinion, that's kind of what he's done. So there, you know, behind all sarcasm and, and humor, I think there's always a little bit of truth. Don't you think? Yeah. Well, that's an extremely polite and charitable way of putting it. I mean, just reframing the damage that he's done as something that is, kind of funny or slightly naughty or something like that. The fact is, is that the, these matters are extremely serious. I mean, we spoke about abortion earlier and that's in the forefront of the news, but it's not the greatest evil of our time. The greatest evil of our time is blasphemy and blasphemies that are enabled through these degenerated liturgies. So yeah, these great. things are gravely horrible beyond human imagining. And we have to sit there and, at least deal with them or think about them. And the right way to do that without losing your mind is through a little bit of levity, peace, and humor. I mean, this is why people in the military, the EMS, medical profession, they all develop these graveyard humors. It's not because they like death or because they like seeing people get hurt. It's because if you don't laugh, you'll cry. I mean, you, you have to be able to laugh about this stuff and take some of the emotional weight off. Otherwise, you're going to go insane if you sit around trying to seriously contemplate it all. And these memes, like these jokes and stuff, it's a way it's it's like a pressure release valve. Yeah. And, you know, I, I any disrespect towards the office of the papacy is is not something that I agree with 
at any time for any reason. But uh, the individual popes in their actions, I think, is fair game, especially if the, you're the one being militated against unfairly. So I thought it was a funny meme, Jason. I knew people got <laughs> mad. These, these nerds were crying behind their keyboards and typing furious replies to you. But uh, yeah. I thought it was funny. I hope you make more. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, we're going to... Uh running up on our first break here but we're going to come back and we're going to pick right up there uh with a quote from fulton sheen about humor so stay with us we'll be right back Did you know that 90% of older adults wish to stay in their home as they age? Aging in place has many benefits. It tends to improve quality of life, which in return improves physical health. Also, retaining independence as we age is critically important to our mental health. Hi, my name is Meredith Stigman, and I am the president of Harmony Home Solutions and an active parishioner of St. Patrick Cathedral. We are your trusted partner for aging in place. We strive to enhance the lives of older adults and their families by providing premier aging in place and universal design lifestyle solutions that increase safety beautifully. Now is the time to get your aging in place plan in order with Harmony Home Solutions. Visit our website today at hhsclt.com. Again, that's hhsclt.com. Or give us a call at 980-220-8821. Again, that's 980-220-8821. We want to help you live an empowered and beautiful life. Catholic Radio is live and on the air at AM 1270, broadcasting from Belmont, North Carolina to the Charlotte Regional Area. Carolina Catholic produces more local content than most Catholic radio stations across our country. Tune in on air, online, on demand, and anytime at www.carolinacatholic.org. Make sure to catch the 2022 Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas replays each Saturday afternoon starting at 3 p.m. You can catch Keith Nestor, Tim Staples, Dr. Ray Garundi, our own Dr. John Aquaviva, and find out what the buzz is all about for the Catholic Men's Conference of the Carolinas. Also, make sure to tune in to the featured men's shows on Carolina Catholic, Faith and Sport with Dr. John Aquaviva, airing on Mondays at 5 p.m. and on demand, The Remnant with Stephen Thomas, Bill Snyder, and Ray Haywood, airing on Saturdays at 5, and my show, The Obligation, which airs at 5 p.m. on Friday. Catch all of these shows and more at AM 1270, on air, online, and over the app at www.carolinacatholic.org. Once again, this has been Jason Murphy. God bless and Esto Vir. And we're back. Thanks for tuning in to The Obligation. My name is Jason Murphy, once again, sitting down with Frank Kona. And we were in a discussion about, you know, Catholic sarcasm and humor and how sometimes that can be a relief in a stressful situation. And uh, Frank was just saying, you know, sometimes if you don't laugh, you'll cry. And I think that's that's very true. Um, you know, we were talking about this meme, this Good Samaritan meme that I came up with. And, and Frank's, you know, Frank said it was pretty good. So I'm probably going to keep working at it, keep keep cranking them out there. So make sure to follow us on Instagram at The Obligation. Um, but yeah, you know, I think with these memes, you know, and humor, um, I think they they bring up conversations, right? They invoke conversations, they provoke thought. And I think we need that. I think we need that. I think, uh, unfortunately, Catholics have kind of become complacent, um, you know, and maybe we haven't thought enough. You know, maybe our thought hasn't been provoked. Uh, but in regards to humor and sarcasm, I wanted to quote um, here from uh, from Bishop Fulton J. Sheen. I- I've never I've never followed uh, Bishop Sheen that much. I've read a couple of his books. It's been several years ago. But, uh, you know, with him being um, on his path to canonization, uh, I think he's become more popular. So you're hearing more about him. So you're seeing more quotes of, of his and, uh, and up again, you know, watching some of his videos and, and uh, he's great. You know, he's, he's, he's just, he was very engaging. Um, and so this quote goes like this, a divine sense of humor belongs to poets and saints because they have been richly endowed with a sense of the invisible 
and can look out upon the same phenomena that other mortals take seriously and see in them something of the divine. You know, what do you think about that, Frank? Doesn't that, isn't that kind of what we're talking yeah. about? That's really great. That sound. It sounds like he was reading some G.K. Chesterton when he thought that quote up. But uh, right. it's true. I mean, you got to be able to look past the impending dread and panic and stuff like that. You're confronted twenty four seven with all this garbage, especially with the news. And then you read the news in Rome, and you have to be able to see through it all. And once yeah. you do, and you understand that everything's going to be okay in the end, and that these things, these evil things. They are willed by God for our better good, and we just have to suffer through them. Once yeah. you understand that, there's nothing but peace, and you won't uh, become angry at memes posted on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we are in a spiritual battle. We are. Every day, every hour, yes. every second. We are engaged in battle. And so, you know, you, you know, being a Marine, you've you've been in battle, right? I mean, you have seen it firsthand, the physical battle. Right. So, you know, that being said, I mean, you know, you've got to be a, you've got to be aware of your surroundings. You got to be a, a, you've got to be aware of your enemy. You know, you've got to be aware of your abilities and uh, and have a plan, right? So, but but you've got to also have time to kind of give yourself a break, right? Can you be on alert? Can you be on guard 24 hours a day? No, you could, but it would have a deleterious effect on your mind. And this is actually what happens with sufferers of PTSD. They uh, don't know how to switch off. They go into this thing called patrol sleep where they're asleep at home in their bed and they wake up every hour like, oh, I'm not supposed to be asleep and just wake mm -hmm. up with a lurch. But it's not knowing how to decompress and take things easier uh, can have massive, massive effects on your mental health and also your spiritual health. You know, any, any anxiety that you have from being overly preoccupied with things is from the devil. And just anything that destroys your spiritual peace, you need to cut out of your life or you need to reevaluate. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what are what are some, um, you know, in your days of, of being out there and being, you know, on the battleground, um, you know, what are some things you guys would do? You know, I mean, you had to you had to have a break. There had to be a break. Right. You know, like we just said, you, you got to have a little bit of break Got to have a little better a bit of uh recreation to recreate kind of your, your, your state of mind, your spirit, you know, what were some things that you guys would do you know, even in the midst of being on, you know, on, on a battleground? Well, you do, you do a lot of things, just standard stuff to uh, relax, unwind, take your mind off things. But I think the most important thing, this is pretty germane to what we've been talking about is humor and very sophisticated forms of clowning. Basically, it, uh, especially if you don't get breaks, sometimes, um, you're out there for days at a time. Things are ongoing for days, weeks at a time. And uh, basically really sophisticated and elaborate uh, humor. Yeah. Increasingly uh, dark graveyard and complex humor is what you need. And it's, it's funny that memes are what a lot of younger Catholics are using today to deal with the crisis. Because, you know, the meme is, it's there's, a, uh, there's an ancient Greek concept called an enthymeme. It's something that Aristotle wrote about in his book on rhetoric. And um, an enthymeme is basically getting, it's a, it's a mechanism for getting someone to, an accept, to accept an idea where they don't necessarily believe in all the proofs for that idea. So if you have a syllogism, like you say, the grass is green, the, uh, uh, all grass is, is grass, therefore all grass is green. With an enthymeme, you just skip over a few of the constructive steps and if you frame an enthymeme clever enough, then people will be forced to accept some of the premises that they would that would be up for debate or something like that. So memes right. are extremely, yeah, they're they're extremely powerful and concise ways of communicating. Do you have like an image or something? You have people. If an image occupies your phantasm, that has the capacity to change your soul. I mean, that's that's why meditation is so good. You want to meditate on holy subjects and good things, and then on top of that, you have a very concise idea. Or a very concise message and boom you don't need to read about it in a book for two hours it's just there on a picture on your instagram right there in front of you so yeah. memes are extremely powerful extremely powerful tools in our fight 
So I encourage you to keep making memes. Uh, keep up the good work. <laughs> I've been I've been kind of kind of doing at least once a day. Uh, you know, at least trying to get something posted a, once a day. So and, I, and maybe it's a little bit cathartic for myself. You know, <laughs> just to just to be able to laugh yeah. at what's going on. And you know, if somebody wants to laugh with me, then that's great. Um, if someone yeah. wants to insult me, I probably probably deserve it. So you know, probably just need to be a little <laughs> more humble. But uh, yeah, but you know, humble too. That's great. Yeah. Right. So can't lose. You know, but back in the day, you know, like in the in the courts, you know, of kings, you know, there there were jesters, right? They had to have, mm -hmm. you know, the, there was poets, there were jesters, you know, they had drama um, and plays. I mean, th these were all sorts of things to kind of take away the mind from, you know, from everything about the kingdom and, and the battles and whatever's going on. Um, and, and years ago, it was kind of an idea was, you know, kind of mentioned to me about you know, we don't have the poets that we used to, you know, it's just not what it was. It's not what it was. You know, there are certainly poets. I consider myself a poet. Uh, you know, I have, I write, you know, things here and there and I've got a, you know, box full of stuff here, you know, here and there that I'll, I'll throw something in there. But, um, yeah. but musicians, you know, that was kind of brought, you know, musicians as music, have, you know, mainstream music, especially, um, became kind of the poetry of our times and it was there was like it was a study of like nirvana you know kurt cobain whether you like him or you hate him or you, you know the music or him as a person whatever um you know there was some interesting perspective on life on things that uh that he that he would say uh basically just saying that you know he, he's you know kind of a poet kind of a because poets basically they've got their thumb on what's going on they kind of say what no one wants to say and it's done in a poetic, poetic manner so that it's a little more, you know, instead of just coming out and calling it, you know, calling the kettle black, you, you kind of dance around it in stanzas and you're like, oh, yeah, the kettle's black. <laughs> you know? yeah. And it's like, you know, like we're talking what we're talking about with a meme. It's kind of a it's an artistic composure kind of saying it. But if you were to come out and said it, people say, oh, you can't say that. That's not right. You shouldn't say that. That's not you know, that's not uh, proper or whatever. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, having, you know, music, you know, in a sense, some depends on the music, you know, depends on the venue of the music. It's very similar. So it's just kind of a, an expression because musicians, you know, like I feel I'm not a big Kurt Cobain Nirvana fan, although, you know, in my young 20s, I, I would, you know, I really liked the music. I thought there were a lot of things that he said, not necessarily the music itself, but a lot of things he said were interesting and they related to me, you know, of course, as a as a as a very wayward, you know, 20 year old at the time. But I, I feel like, you know, especially, you know, uh, an artist like Kurt Cobain or something of that nature, you know, they kind of had their thumb on things out there that people were screaming about. You know, he has one line, I think uh, he tried hard to have a father, but instead he had a dad. And I, you know, as a young 20 year old who didn't, you know, really know, you know, up from down or, you know, east from west, and I didn't have much going on for me. I felt the same when I heard that, because that was something I really um you know, I wanted to have that father figure that was from my father, but you know, I didn't get that till later on. And unfortunately it was right before he passed away, but I'm forever grateful. I, I eventually had that, um, that father, you know, and, and because for so long I thought, well, I've just got this dad, you know, and he's just, he's a good guy and everybody likes him and he tells jokes and he's fun, but there wasn't much depth there. But of course, now that my dad has passed, I appreciate that all the more. And we, ne we never can appreciate those things. We don't ever appreciate that from people or things or places and you know sometimes until we you know they're gone or we can't have them again so um so i think you know yeah. just kind of similarly with you know kurt cobain and that's you know when he said that um it just felt like he you know just kind of saying what we all sometimes feel you know, that's kind of what poets did that's kind of what musicians do um and that's what the memes are doing you know they're kind of they're kind of putting stuff out there so anyway i don't want to beat that into the ground but just want to close out with that <laughs> thought there and uh We've been talking way too much about memes. This has just been a <laughs> meme hour. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody needs to make a meme of this show right now. Maybe just come out. That would be a high honor being being memed by somebody. That would be great. <laughs> Feel free, you know. Uh, definitely, if you got uh, <laughs> you got the wherewithal to put together a meme of this episode, send it out there to info at the show dot com. Uh, no, but all seriousness, though. Um, you know, that but that brings us kind of where we are. OK, so what are we memeing about? We're memeing about um, things going on with the church. Right. That's kind of that's kind of where most of mine have been kind of some of the questions, uh, pro thought provoking issues, you know, saying things and asking questions that, you know, we just don't have the answers for. You know, we're just confused about, um, 
Yeah, and what choice do you have? I mean, if you try to talk earnestly and formally in public about some of these things, you get shut down. There's people that don't want you to talk about it. There's people that will punish you for talking, especially if you're a priest. If you become too vocal about things as a diocesan priest, they'll send you off to St. John Vianney and say that, oh, he has an alcohol problem. He has an anger problem. We found porn on his computer, or, you know, quote fingers. We found porn on his computer. And after you're there, it's like they, they can just mold you into whatever priest they want you to be. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really sad that a lot of traditional priests kind of get shuffled to other places or uh, get put away or get shut up. You know, having their faculties to preach removed, they can still say mass. It's just all sorts of different things that are being done today to shut down communication and to shut down just free speech. I don't want to use the term free speech because I don't believe in that in and of itself. But what can you do if you're not allowed to talk about things openly? You have to talk about them in kind of a veiled way, like using memes or writing uh, poetry or, or through fiction. I, I think that's why George Orwell wrote Animal Farm, right? Because mm. he wanted to talk about something in a secretive and veiled way. And a lot of good Catholic writers and Catholic meme makers like yourself and Catholic radio show hosts are doing the same thing. Yeah. Because you can't just come out and talk about this stuff. It's it's forbidden. It's uh, shut down. You'll be a persona non grata at your church. Like, what else can you do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've, I'm thankful, you know, to have this venue because it's allowed me to explore and study and learn. And I've said it before, you know, in this information uh, you know, explosion of, of social media and all this content readily available on our phones, I've, I've really gotten away from from reading and studying like I should. And, you know, now that, you know, we've been doing the show for, you know, going on two years, you know, it, it gives me a, a reason and a responsibility to continue to study. Um, and, and kind of, you know, be on top of things and pay attention to what's going on. So I'm, 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 I'm grateful to have this, this venue because it's, it's good for me as well. You know, even if it's just you and I, and you're the only one listening. And sometimes when I'm just sitting there doing a monologue, you know, I may listen to that show two or three or four times, you know, after it's you know published just to, to kind of go back through it and say, wow, you know, that's, that's something I need to look into more, or, Hey, maybe I need to think about the way I said this or that. And, um, so, yeah, so, you know, using these devices uh, for the greater glory, of course, very important. Um, you know, speaking of the traditional Latin mass, you know, and some of the controversies going on, obviously, you know, we've we've spoke before, you know, my my conversion, my reversion came through the finding of the traditional Latin mass uh, back in 1995, I think, um, through the, you know, the St. Anthony's Chapel, the Society of St. Pius X. And I walked in one Sunday and just, it was uh, otherworldly. And that's the big, that's the big word I always use, otherworldly, because it was, it was something that I was not accustomed to. And I know that your, your reversion, you know, kind of revolves in, in that same, um, same realm. Yeah, St. Anthony's played a, a big role in my reversion. It came after, but it definitely was a big part of it. Oh, by the way, uh, you should walk into St. Anthony's again some other Sunday, because uh, we'd love to see it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we, my wife and I, we've been talking, uh, for, for quite a while, ever since we really got on, um, on this topic, you know, the, since Traditiones Custodes came down and, you know, these ramifications against the, uh, the traditional Latin mass and, you know, I'd kind of got away from it and she converted into the Novus Ordo and really only knew the Novus Ordo. And, um, you know, so it's, it's in our future, you know, the traditional Latin mass in one way, shape or form, um, we we plan on visiting as a family. You know, I really want my children to see it. It's difficult for me to go to mass uh, and sit there sometimes and just kind of look over at my kids. And as much as I try to be engaged, it's difficult to be engaged. It's just not conducive to being engaged, and it's just not yeah. uh, conducive to prayer uh, in many cases. Not all cases, but in many cases. Why don't you tell me more? Because right now I, I'm, I'm single and I go to mass and I have a head full of sugar plum fairies and I, I find it hard to focus on the mass like just as is. So, I mean, what, what are the challenges of taking children to mass? I can only imagine. You know, a lot of movement, <laughs> a lot of distraction, <laughs> which is already there. Um, hmm. You know, with six, it's it can, it can sometimes be difficult. Um, I would say all of the kids, though, from the four-year-old up, so five of them, 
pretty good. I can go in there and, you know, and if, if the baby who's now one and a half, so not, not really a baby much anymore, you know, if she starts to acting up or making noise, Joanne will step out with her and I'll have the five there. And for the most part, they know we're, you know, they know, we're, you know, I mean business, you know, we're, we're there to, to pay attention. Um, so it's, uh, you know, I, my, what, what I worry most about is probably my 14 and a half year old, you know, he, he listens, he listens to some of the shows, you know, we have conversations and he hears, he overhears conversations kind of between my wife and I and what's going on with the church and, uh, you know, thing, the differences between the Novus Ordo and the traditional Latin mass and the music, which most men are, are not engaged with. And so my concern is, you know, kind of thinking, I can say, you know, it, you know, I can say we should do this and I can show you how we should do this. But really when I'm taking you to mass, which is supposed to be the source and summit of our Catholic faith, and that is not at the same level uh, of, of, uh, of reverency and, um, and honor that I feel that our Lord is due because of the, you know, the, the secular feel that it can sometimes have. You know, there are certain parishes that can say it really well. You know, the Cathedral of St. Patrick, you know, St. Anne's, St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, some of your more traditional parishes in town, they can say the Novus Ordo very reverently. And um, and it's it's not a very distraction. But the difference, again, is, you know, we still have the readings are done by non-clerics and, uh, and, and women, you know, and, and there's a lot of inflection. And, and so as much as we may be trying to focus um, it's just distracting. You know, you can have a, a sanctuary filled with seminarians and priests, and yet a woman or even a man will come up, and more times than not, it's a woman who'll come and do the readings. And it, that's always just confused me. Why we would why would we do that? Um, that's not a traditional role of a lector. Um, that's traditionally the role of, of someone in formation or a cleric, a deacon, perhaps, um, yeah. who would take that role. So, uh, I know a lot of people out there listening, like, Oh, that's horrible. You know, cause, cause I'm, that's going to even go to altar girls, you know, cause I, I, you know, you hear it here. I don't agree with the altar girls. It doesn't make sense. There's no end to justify the means. They're not called to the priesthood. They're not, you know, there's not going to be uh, a female priest. Yeah. So serving if there's on not the altar be- is a clerical office. I mean, the same okay. goes for the scola. The scola is supposed to be men because it's a clerical office and right. having women fulfill clerical offices. Everybody knew that was wrong up until the liberalizing elements in the church came in yeah. and started wrecking the place. Like, What's the difference? What happened in, from then to now where all of a sudden we have altar girls and we have women presuming to read uh, the Psalms. Yeah, that mass. was never declared. You know, that was that was that was a, an abuse along with communion in the hand. You know, yeah. these were things and uh, the priest facing facing the faithful. You know, these are not yeah. things that were declared at Vatican II you know, to yeah. be in- implemented. And, you know, another thing, just the uh, it, it's obviously extremely distracting and weird and it causes bedlam and chaos. But the, the worst thing about it is the offense given to God by these by this monkeying around at the mass. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very bad that we you know, go to mass and we're disturbed by this stuff, but that's very secondary compared to the offense given to God because God decided how he wanted the liturgy. He figured it out and he gave it to us out, out of mercy. And, yeah. you know, in uh quote primum, Pius V, he said that the Latin mass is the mass of all ages until the end of time. That yeah. Any priest can say the Latin mass at any time without fear of retribution. Yeah. Somehow that got lost in translation. I don't know what happened, but uh, no, it's true. Yeah. So, I mean, back to the, you know, back to that point, um, you know, I think I said it here on this show before one time we went to a mass in North Myrtle beach and after mass, my son looked at me and he said, you know, the altar girls did better than the priest. You know, the <laughs> irony behind that statement <laughs> really made me stop and give thought to what are we doing here? Because I tell my kids before mass, during mass, after mass, you need to be participating. And yet certain, you know, hymns will come on that I'm not going to, I'm not going to sing that garbage. And so I'm going to look at my son, you know, and my first instinct is, well, you should be singing. And, you know, maybe I should be singing, set an example. But no, this is not, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's contrary to the way we're, you know, really should be giving honor to God with some of these 1970s good time uh, ballads uh, that yeah. just don't have no place in, in the sanctity of the mass. I mean, they're just, uh, they're, they're yeah, around the campfire it's, maybe, but you know, it, during yeah, the it's time. obviously not conducive to prayer. I mean, um, it, the ideal music, the most conducive music to prayer being Gregorian monophonic chant. And plain again, chant. that's what Vatican II called for, didn't they? Yeah. I mean, it just got, it's gotten so far away from what every doctor of the church and every church father knew to be right. It's like, they're, not open. They're very doing it very surreptitiously, but they're doing it. They're trying to undermine what we've known to be true for literally thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, even the even the documents of Vatican II said that Gregorian chant should be uh, play, have have its honor within the Mass, and Latin should be the preferred language. Um, and mm -hmm. and we're nowhere near that. You know, it, it'd be a different conversation if we were doing the Mass of Paul the Sixth the way it. I don't know. I don't even know if there's a way <laughs> because it's led to so many abuses. But, you know, as much as it was butchered, you know, we'd be in a we'd be in a different situation, I think. But I mean, that's the whole purpose of butchering the mass was to butcher the church and butcher the faithful. So, I mean, you can't look at it and say, well, if you would have just read the documents properly or instilled the mass properly. Yeah, we're 60 years down the road. Back to the Coca-Cola analogy. It didn't <laughs> work. It didn't work. Yeah. It's not working. Why are we, you know, I was thinking about it during mass on Sunday. It's like the church today is trying to, they're trying to encapsulate society at a particular place in time, but society is ever evolving because everything in this world evolves. The only thing true and holy and stays the same outside of time and space, just like our Lord is the holy sacrifice of the mass. So why are we trying to encapsulate and, and make it a momentary piece of time like, like the world is when it, it, it can't? It can't because tomorrow it's going to be different and next week is going to be different. Next year it's going to be different. It's ever changing. Why are we going to allow our holy, the holy sacrifice of math to be um, subject to such change and, yeah. and, and familiarity? It doesn't make sense. You know, it doesn't. Instead, make sense instead of having the, the mass change with the world, we need to let the mass change the world. Absolutely. You know, it's, instead of the, uh, the world of being permitted to change the mass or to, have additions to profound. it or innovations to it. I'm, I'm not very qualified to speak on it. There's obviously much more qualified people to speak about it, but I'm, I'm a layman. I'm semi-literate. I'm not that well-read about anything, but even I, even I can know, I, even I can tell because the, uh, the, the unchanging character of the mass is what makes it great. I mean, when they were, they were talking about adding St. Joseph to the canon, I think it was Gregory the Great that did that. It was a huge, kerfluffle like the people tried to have him lynched and all sorts of things so, and uh, god if we only had a respect and a love for the mass that came even close to that if we had popes that respected the the canon of the mass and the liturgy of the mass as much as the old school popes did then things would be very different today but today you can monkey around with the mass you can add additions to it you can add whatever kind of music you you think is going to get the most butts and seats I feel like a lot of what's driving it is butts and seats. But even that's misguided because the traditional Latin mass community is the fastest growing sector of the church right now. Ironically, they statistically give more money than these people that show up for drum, you know, dance masses, clown masses, puppet masses, whatever. Yeah. Instead of the mass being changed by the world, the mass needs to change the world. Frank Conan, we'll be right back. 2022 is bringing many new and exciting changes to our Carolina Catholic Apostolate, built to communicate how to better learn, love, and live our Catholic faith. We begin with our name change to Carolina Catholic Media. This reflects the expanded scope of Carolina Catholic Radio to include the development of our podcast, streaming, social media, YouTube, and direct marketing platforms. 2022 is a very important year for the Catholic Church. As a result, Carolina Catholic Media will feature more local news, information, and conversation to reflect what's happening now and how it impacts our local Catholic community. Throughout the year, Carolina Catholic Media will showcase our Catholic schools and homeschools, the Charlotte Diocese 50th anniversary, and the two-year worldwide synod process that begins on the diocesan level. We encourage you to get involved, join us, and catch the spirit. 
The Carolina Catholic Media Apostolate is a 501c3 nonprofit. We are 100% funded by you. Please consider a donation, monthly tithe, or business sponsorship to support our mission and vision to spread the truth of Jesus Christ and our Catholic faith across the Carolinas. Thank you for discerning a role in our apostolate. May God bless you abundantly. And we are back once again, sitting down with Frank Kona on the obligation. Frank, thanks again for being with us. Having a great time. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you've listened to any of Frank and I talk in the past, you know, sometimes we'll, uh, I guess our first show, we brought in some tinfoil hats and, um, we took the deep dive, man. (laughs) We really took the deep dive. Um, Mm -hmm. make it a few connections there with the uh, world economic forum and the synod on synodality. And, um, you know, I say let's 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 get let's get back into it here. You know, I'd like to I'd like to talk about you know a couple of quotes from Archbishop Vigano, who has been pretty outward about the direction of the church, and um, you know one of the, one of the quotes here that stood out recently. There's a couple here I'll read, but um, you know the first one he says is the deep church and the deep state move in parallel and in sync because what moves them both is hatred for Jesus Christ. I think that's that's very profound and, and very true because ultimately that's what we're up against, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, you have people like Padre Pio speak about the infiltration of the lodge, the uh, international f- uh, Freemasonry. That's what's driving the deep state. That's also what's driving the deep church is membership in the lodge. Yeah, and this is. I don't think any serious Catholic would dispute that. I mean, only only the most liberal and modernist Catholic would throw any objections that to to that idea. But yeah. we're pretty we're seeing it pretty clearly in how lockstep they are. Uh, just their plans are totally mirroring each other. It seems like the church is, uh, or at least the Rome and uh, modern the modernist Vatican is kind of tethered to these ideas and these agendas that they have. Yeah, I mean that's that's ultimately it. You know, uh, you know. Satan is very keen. He knows knows when and how to attack. And uh, obviously, like you said earlier, you know, the attack on on our Lord, you know, the blasphemies, the sacrileges, um, you know, s- the sins against the first commandment. Uh, that's that's where and then, you know, it, 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 it kind of rolls on down the hill from there. Um, you know, but again, you know, another quote, uh, he says, I urge my brothers in the episcopate the priests and all the faithful to understand this fundamental aspect of the present apostasy because we will not be able to do any good to convert civil society and restore the royal crown to Christ as long as that crown has been usurped by his enemies within the very womb of the church. I mean, that reminds me of, you know, Paul VI and his statement, you know, the smoke of Satan has entered the church. I mean, if anything's not, you know, not clear of that, I mean, that's what we're up against. You know, we are up against powers and principalities in this present darkness. And that's where it is. And that's where Archbishop Vigano is talking about. Deep church and the deep state, they move in parallel. You know, these temptations, you know, all these things, they may not seem super spiritual. They may not seem like a full, you know, spiritual attack, but they're moving in parallel. They're moving in conformity to make us fall because that's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just on a greater greater level, you know, as a whole, when we stand up and we get the bird's eye view of the greater perspective, because where the battle is, is in individual souls, you know, um, the individual sins and the weakness that it creates as the body of Christ is weakened. You know, we know that from our Lord, um, yeah. you know, so we've got to bolster our efforts, um, stay close to the sacraments, stay close to prayer and, uh, you know, keep moving forward. Um, That's right, Jason. It really is the little things. If you want to defeat international Freemasonry, go to bed on time. Pray your rosary hmm. every day. That's the, if you don't have that step in place, you're not going to make any difference. There's one of those like uh, Facebook boomer inspirational quotes going around. That's like, a wise monk once said, I tried to change the world, but I couldn't change my community. And I couldn't change my community because I couldn't change myself. If only I would changed myself my community would have been changed. And then if my community had been changed, the world, all these things kind of have this foundation of you doing what we're called to as the bare minimum as Catholics is by praying every day. 
you know, I think it was St. Augustine that said, if you pray every day, you're, you're certainly going to become a saint. If you don't pray every day, you're certainly going to go to hell. It's <laughs> really that simple. It is really that yeah. simple. It is. You know, it's the little things. It's uniting the little sufferings for the greater glory. Um, and there's a story, I think it's St. Teresa, the child Jesus, I think about her life. She, um, you know, she would get so frustrated because the nun she would wash dishes next to would always splash her with water. You know, and she becomes so frustrated and that would chip away at her charity. And if anyone that's ever lived in community, you know, I, I can I can vouch, you know, it's, it's difficult, um, you know, same guys, same day, you know, same problems. This person has this person, you know, this attitude or, or does this funny little thing, these habits or whatever that are just, you know, you, you, we judge others. Right. And of course, now I live in community with with seven other people, you know, six kids and a wife. So even more so. <laughs> um, but I thought of that the other day because I was thinking, you know, I get so frustrated with these little things. And we, you know, even with our family, we become very judgmental and we don't recognize the small crosses. And so, you know, the, the screaming child or the the food left, you know, on the counter or the, the lights left on. These are all the little splashes from the little nun next to you, who, of course, is, you know, fighting her way to heaven as well. You know, so if we can just recognize in these little things, you know, like you said, going to bed on time, you know, such an important thing, an act of discipline, um, you know, making your bed every day. I hate making my bed, but I do it. I mean, yeah. I, hate getting dressed, yeah. I hate getting dressed up for Sunday mass. I mean, in a way, I, I want to honor our Lord, but like on a physical level, it's a pain. But, yeah. you know, I know it's for the greater glory, you know, to put that tie yeah. on and, and do those things. So, you know, it's 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 uniting those little sufferings. And that's what St. Teresa, she eventually recognized. Um, but, you know, uniting those small little sufferings every day. That's that's where the battle is. You know, it's it's not in the grandiose accomplishments and wielding the gladiator sword against, you know, yeah. Goliath, which sometimes it is, sometimes it is, but, you know, most of the time yeah. it's, uh, it takes place in those little battles and, and along those little beads that, you know, yeah. we should be praying every day. And I've, I've met a lot of young men that were solicitous towards for, for martyrdom or for big things, big fights, battles, but you know, it, your room's messy, man. If you can't clean your room or go to bed on time, you, you don't have the uh, the strength to suffer martyrdom. What makes you think that you can suffer a, a tremendous heavy cross if you can't even suffer the little tiny baby crosses that God gives you? God knows how weak we are, and he gives us little tiny crosses that are appropriate. My life's really nice. My crosses are so tiny because God knows I'm weak. <laughs> so like being solicitous for bigger crosses or monumental crosses because you yeah. think you're cut out for it. It's just, and you haven't accepted the tiny crosses. First things yeah. first. It's in the daily cross. It's in the daily martyrdom. Um, I was looking for uh, a quote from uh, Cardinal Zen, you know, from China who, you know, was arrested. I mean, 90 year old Cardinal, you know, arrested for uh, these allegations against him, um, who actually was a proponent of the traditional Latin mass. And, uh, you know, basically stating he was guilty of collusion and, you know, against the national security of China. Uh, but he stated that uh, martyrdom is normal in the church, you know, and he was uniting his sufferings and his false accusations, um, trying to bring him down, um, you know, a 90 year old man, you know, basically trying to be, you know, a good and faithful Catholic and, you know, supporting his seminarians and his diocese and the traditional Latin mass, you know, being, you know, marked as, as a criminal. Um, he's saying that's normal. And I think it's, it's very normal. I think the daily martyrdom is, um, is very normal for us all, as long as we recognize it, because uh, our Lord will give us that, you know, he will allow us to, uh, to, to find those and those little crosses if we look for them and unite them with the larger cross of his crucifixion and passion. And, um, that's how we get to heaven. So, yeah. well, I think we've been around and back again and, uh, you know, once again, as always, a lot more to cover, a lot of stuff we didn't get to cover, but I'm sure we will do it next time. Before we go, um, I want you to, you know, speaking of these, um, you know, you mentioned um, going to bed on time. And I think that was an article that was just published in the Sword of Santiago, I think, latest issue of the yeah, Sword of Santiago. Right. Tell everybody out there what the Sword of Santiago is and how it relates. The Sword of Santiago is the official newsletter of St. Anthony Padua Catholic Church. Um, 
I edit and write for it. Uh, we have a lot of great guest writers. The newsletter goes out to the faithful and to the Holy Name Society, and there's a lot of overlap there. But um, most of the men we have writing for it are members of the Holy Name Society, or they're at least somehow affiliated. And um, I get a lot of great guest writers. There's a lot of people who want to write for it, and they write some awesome articles. Uh, also, this newsletter is under my creative control completely and totally. Uh, man wants to write something, I'll print it. It's not subject to uh, any other sort of review. So we can say a lot of things that um, are unpalatable or can't be said normally on uh, social media networks, whatever the case may be. So it's been a great blessing to have just being able to talk honestly and to uh, bring back the tone of pre-1900 Catholicism. So they used to write about the Civilta uh, Catholica, the official newspaper of the Vatican. They wrote some stuff that would get them kicked off of Facebook, you know, <laughs> permanently banned, like pro possible jail time in, in some countries in Europe. Yeah. But it was true, and Catholics needed to hear it. And the uh, really severe and masculine tone of it is something that you can't find today. You can find nice, happy, consoling things everywhere you look. But you can't find anything severe that really challenges you as a man to do something greater or to be more or to look in. So it's been good. Awesome. Well, that's great. Yeah. So again, the Holy Name Society and the newsletter, The Sword of Santiago. Uh, if anybody out there wants to learn more about that, send us an email at theobligationshow.com. Frank, uh, a pleasure as usual. And uh, we will definitely pick up where we left off next time. Yeah, likewise, Jason. I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, God bless and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.